Hi there. Welcome to What's News Focus. We've been talking about climate change and global warming for quite some time now, decades in fact, and many countries have taken quite a few steps to reduce their carbon footprint, to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases they emit, and to switch over to clean energy in general. So much so that it was recently found that Scotland gets 97% of its energy from clean sources. Denmark wants to make an entire island in the North Sea just to feed it clean solar and wind energy. And other countries are getting in on it too, but there are a set of scientists that are asking the question, what if it's not enough? What if we're not reacting fast enough and we need something a little more drastic? So in response to that, there's a set of Harvard scientists that want to try their hand at dimming the sun. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Okay, so today's episode is basically about solar geoengineering and the conversation around it. Now, if that sounds too technical, let me break it down to you very simply. You know how we paint our houses white, that sunlight is reflected and the house doesn't get too hot? That's basically it. That is solar geoengineering at the scale of your house. Scientists want to do that at the scale of the earth. So how do they go about doing that? Well, the first thing is to see how the Earth does it for itself. One of the big contributors to keeping the Earth cool are polar ice caps. And what they do for the Earth is the same as what that white paint does for your house. They reflect vast amounts of sunlight back into space, thereby keeping the Earth cool. Problem is, with global warming, ice caps are melting. What's left in their place is vast dark ocean. Dark oceans absorb solar radiation and contribute to global warming. To add fuel to fire, we then inject carbon into the atmosphere, which then keeps the heat in the atmosphere and further increases global warming and so on and so forth. Now, there are various ways that scientists have come up with to control the amount of solar radiation our atmosphere absorbs. And they range from growing plants and trees that are more reflective to sending a huge space mirror out into space to reflect sunlight before it even reaches the Earth. But a lot of these are not very practical, not very viable. The two options that are being considered today by scientists are marine cloud brightening and stratospheric aerosol injection. And we'll talk about that. First, marine cloud brightening. What this is, is basically cloud seeding. What they want to do is get ships to traverse the ocean and then throw salt up into the lower atmosphere, thereby inducing cloud formation. When the clouds form over the oceans, they cover the oceans, they block them from sunlight, they reflect the sunlight back into space, ocean stays cool, atmosphere stays cool. That's basically it. Now there are two problems with this technique. One is that if you did manage to cool down a certain area by say 2 degrees, what would the knock-on effects be? What would the effect on the surrounding parcels of air be? Would there be a shift in weather patterns around that area? We don't know and we're trying to model those out. But even if we did, if you've ever been to a country that has tried cloud seeding, you'll know that it's a little bit hit or miss. It doesn't always work. So scientists are now looking at the second option, which is stratospheric aerosol injection. And this holds more promise, but it's also the topic of much controversy. See, scientists looked at volcanoes and noticed that when a volcano erupts, it sends vast plumes of smoke and ash up into the air. This is mostly sulfur dioxide. The sulfur dioxide then spreads over a large part of the world because of wind patterns. And whichever part of the world it covers, it cools down because it just blocks out the sun a bit. So scientists wanted to do the same. The problem is if you use sulfur dioxide, it's toxic. And when it comes down, it comes down as acid rain. That's less than ideal. So a bunch of Harvard researchers have decided to go ahead and experiment with this by dispersing calcium carbonate instead, a non-toxic substance that's found in chalk, limestone, calcium supplements, and antacids. They want to grind calcium carbonate down into a fine dust, send it up with a balloon, and disperse it in the air, and then make measurements above and below it to see how much of the light it cuts out, how much of the mixing of the air takes place, how long it takes to disperse, and so on. The idea being to have a non-toxic substance that's dispersed in the atmosphere, that blocks out the sun a little bit, cools down the air under it, and then disperses to the point where it doesn't affect the level of dust in the climate. Now, if you're thinking in general, putting more dust in the atmosphere is probably not a great idea. And maybe there are other effects that we don't know yet. You're not the only one. There are a set of scientists that advocate for caution. They're basically asking governments to put in 100 to 200 million dollars over the next five years 
to just sit down and think about a few of the factors that go into this sort of experiment. There is already some research suggesting that this sort of methodology results in a lowering of rainfall, which is really bad for places like Africa and India because they're the first ones that will probably feel the effects of a drought. Developing countries will generally be affected worse than developed countries should something happen. So who gets to decide where the experiments are done, how the experiments are done. The scientists that are calling for caution and calling for further study before actually experimenting are saying, we don't know enough, so we should at least think about all the factors and move ahead with caution. Ironically, the scientists at Harvard that are pushing for the experimentation use the same argument and they have a point. See, the Harvard scientists say that no matter how much we try to model things out and simulate things, we just don't have the data because we've never done this before. And they're not wrong. Humans, generally speaking, only learn by doing. We can't simulate the unknown. That, combined with the benefit of having another tool in our arsenal to fight climate change, is far too tempting for universities and scientists not to experiment. So it's safe to conclude that this sort of experiment is going to happen one way or the other. The questions people are asking now are revolving around things like, how do we govern such experiments? How do all nations get a say in how these things are done? And can they come together and assist any countries that are adversely affected by large-scale experiments that we may take in the future? Given that these experiments are going to happen one way or the other, we definitely need to talk about this now rather than later. It's going to take a while, it's not going to be easy. And if you've had a look at politics, getting any large number of countries to agree on any one thing is just seemingly impossible at this point. But the conversation needs to happen now rather than later. I'm going to leave links down below so you can learn more about this. Tell me in your comments section what you think some of the effects would be and whether you think this sort of experimentation at this sort of scale should go on or not. I'd love to hear from you. That's our segment today, but we'll see you in the next episode. Till then, stay happy, stay peaceful, stay colorful.